Hi, this talk is about the lie that you probably tell 10, 50, 100 times a day. I have read and understood the privacy policy. It's not just you, I do it too. Uh, my name is David Neal. I'm a researcher at the Amsterdam University Medical Center in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm a doctor, uh, I'm a psychologist, and I do research about the use of technology by people with dementia. And you can see some of the organizations that I work with on the slide. In case you're very busy and don't have time to watch this whole video, I thought I'd summarize what I'm about to tell you in, uh, in one slide. And so these are, the, these are the key points that I want to cover today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the idea of cognitive accessibility. I'm going to tell you that that is uh, uh, important for online environments and it's an ethical imperative in healthcare. I'm going to tell you that uh, online interactions have a cost and that costs something to our privacy, even if it doesn't cost us any money. Uh, data collection when using online tools is a kind of entry fee that we pay for using online tools. Most privacy policies, uh, which should be detailing the entry fees, so what data is collected from us and how is it going to be used, are not cognitively accessible. And this is a huge problem which we urgently need to address in healthcare to improve cognitive accessibility, to protect privacy online, and to generally behave ethically in how we use technology. So that's the entire talk in one slide, but I'll drill down into these things in a little bit more detail. So I said, I, I want to talk about how cognitive accessibility is an ethical imperative. Now, uh, accessibility, I think we kind of understand in a physical perspective, and these are some great, terrible examples of accessibility. Uh, in this case, thinking about wheelchair users who might need, uh, in, need ramps to access certain areas. Why is it important? Well, uh, we want to respect people's privacy. We've got a, 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 an ethical duty to respect people's privacy by default. If we're giving up something in terms of privacy, which is always the case, uh, if we're interacting with tools that collect any kind of data from us, then we should be able to make informed choices uh, about what data is collected, uh, what data is used, and whether we're okay with that. That's an important part of our autonomy, which is a huge part, the right to make informed decisions for ourselves, it's a huge part of medical and healthcare ethics. So if we're giving something up in terms of privacy, we should be choosing and be able to make informed choices about that. Um, and uh, if we're gonna make those choices, the information that we get about that, that would come in the form of a privacy policy. That privacy policy, I need to be able to read it and understand it and weigh up the information that's in there. And that's where the idea of cognitive accessibility comes in, that I've got to be able to process that information. But there's a third ethical aspect um, to cognitive accessibility of online environments as well. So just like with the physical accessibility, the uh, ramps help us actually all have equitable access to physical environments, to go shopping, to go to the doctors, uh, to go to a police station, to go to wherever we want to go in the environment, in the community. Certain people may need additional help to access online environments, online resources. Um, and that's an imperative because of you know, our desire to treat people equitably, to have justice in society. And if uh, online environments are not accessible, um, we're saying that certain groups are willing and able to use online tools that could be very beneficial and other groups are not, which doesn't seem very ethical. So I mentioned that uh, often when we're using particularly free uh, online tools or apps, uh, it's not really free. We don't pay any money, but we give up some kind of data about ourselves, about how we're using these tools as a kind of entry fee. Uh, there's a nice saying, maybe you know it, uh, if you can't work out what the product is, what's paying for, uh, you are the product. So yeah, uh, that is, I think, a, a generally understood uh, idea. So we said that if we want to make informed decisions about whether we want to pay the entry fee associated with a particular app or website or other uh, online tool, we need to be able to make a decision about that. We need to know what uh, data is being collected, how it's being used, and that information would be contained in the privacy policy. But the question is whether that privacy policy is what we call cognitively accessible. And what that means is, uh, you can see on the slide, there's a definition of cognitive accessibility, which essentially is thinking about 
all of the things I need to be able to process um, to be able to read and understand that privacy information. You know, I, it has to be there. I have to be able to find it, but I have to be able to interact with that, with a website or wherever that privacy policy may be um, in a way that is going to help me to focus on it, to pay attention to it, uh, uh, to understand the language that's used in that text. These are all cognitive processes that would require energy and require a, a certain level of cognitive processing. And the point is, it's about taking into account all users. So again, if you think back to that picture of the, of the ramps, so in that case, uh, you know, you're thinking very specifically about people that have impairments or disabilities who need to use a wheelchair. And obviously there are people that have cognitive impairments. You know, we can think about people living with dementia or brain injury. Um, but we all actually, to a greater or lesser extent, uh, you know, have moments where we have more cognitive power in the day and moments when we have less cognitive power. Uh, I got up at six this morning with my six month old son, and I didn't have a lot of cognitive power at that time to spend on, you know, processing complex information. And we also know that in other mental health conditions, for example, in depression, um, that also has an impact on our ability to focus on things and our cognitive power. So the point is, uh, privacy information needs to be accessible to everybody. It needs to be cognitively accessible to everybody that might be using our services if we're going to provide, as we said, ethical, equitable uh, access and autonomy. Unfortunately, this may come as no surprise, uh, I've just concluded some research, which we're in the process of publishing, which suggests that privacy policies on the whole are not cognitively accessible. Um, so how did we look at cognitive accessibility in practice? Uh, so my colleagues and I looked at three things. We looked at, uh, were we able to actually, uh, was there privacy, a privacy policy available for, uh, for health and wellness apps? Uh, was, it, was it where we were able to find it easily uh, and were we able to read it easily? So we collected 180 privacy policies from health and wellness apps and websites in the Netherlands, Sweden, and the UK to look at those three things. Um, and on the right, I mean, yeah, you know these privacy policies, they're very long text documents. So you know, we had a strong suspicion that they were not gonna be uh, available, findable, or readable. And that is pretty much what we found. So, um, are privacy policies available? Well, yeah, if you look at the graph on the left, we found that uh, more than 90% of health apps had a privacy policy available uh, where we were looking in the, in the App Store um, or the Google Play Store, but not 100%. So I think that's the most important finding there is that in none of the countries uh, did all of the health and wellness apps even have a privacy policy that we could identify. Of those that did have a privacy policy, if you're in the UK, you're in luck because they were all in English. If you were in the Netherlands or in Sweden, uh, again, most of the privacy policies were only available in English, even in those countries. So only about 16%, 17% of the Dutch uh, health apps had a privacy policy available in Dutch. And in Sweden, again, only about 26, 27% of uh, the apps that we identified had a privacy policy available in Swedish. And otherwise, you would have to be able to speak English uh, as a second language just to be able to read that privacy policy, just to be able to get an idea of, OK, what's my sort of privacy entry fee for using this health app? How easy were they to find? Well, uh, most of the apps that we identified, you could get to the privacy policy with just one click. Slightly fewer in Sweden and the Netherlands. And that was partly because a lot of the time, uh, if you went straight to an English language policy, you could click again to then get a translation. Why it didn't just go straight to the default, you know, Sweden or, or Swedish or Dutch policy, I don't know. But in any case, uh, most of the time you could get there with one click. But again, not, not all of the time. And uh, we also looked at whether there were kind of things that might be distracting as you're trying to locate a privacy policy. So if there are pop-ups or little films or GIFs or videos or... So we looked at, at that as well. Um, and actually, the, most of the time, those things were not uh, an issue. So in the Netherlands and the UK, sort of 20 to 30 percent uh, of the time, we encountered at least one thing that we thought, oh, that's quite distracting. Uh, but in Sweden, uh, again, Swedish design, it turns out it's not just a stereotype. Uh, the Swedish uh, apps and websites, 
there were very, very few um, potentially distracting design elements. So that was a positive. And maybe the, the other countries could, uh, could learn something from that. So once we'd found them, we looked at where they're easy to read. So we looked at how long it would have taken us to read each privacy policy. Um, and that's the graph on the left. So this is for each privacy policy that we, we found. So for the Netherlands, about eight, uh, nine minutes. For Sweden, uh, about five and a half minutes for each privacy policy. Uh, and in the UK, it would have taken almost 15 minutes uh, on average to read each of the privacy policies. So that means that you know, if you before you start using an app that you're downloading from the app store, want to know, okay, what data am I giving up? Who's using it? Where's it? All? And you want to know all of those details. It will take you 15 minutes on average to read it <clears throat> and find out. And that is for the average adult. That's not even anybody that maybe has difficulty with uh, language or with the complexity of the language. Which brings us on to the next point. So we looked at uh, the reading level of the texts. So there's a scale for European languages that goes from A to C with, with <clears throat> two subscales per, per level. So A is, is kind of really basic language. You don't have to be particularly uh, skilled in that language to understand the text. B is uh, sort of moderate complexity and C is almost kind of academic level complexity. So you'd have to be kind of at an academic level in that language to understand the text. And we've identified one uh, single privacy policy uh, that was at level B, at that moderate level complexity. Um, and 179 then were at that really complex academic level. So <clears throat> what we found in this research recently uh, carried out is that in at least three European countries, uh, privacy policies are not uh, cognitively accessible, which means they are going to be difficult for the average person to access and very difficult, if not impossible, for people to access who are maybe living with cognitive impairments. So given the importance of privacy in itself uh, and the importance of being able to access online environments increasingly in our society uh, and you know the, the the need for autonomy to respect autonomy to respect privacy and to create uh, you know, equitable access to online environments this really is a, a really urgent imperative for us to do something about this in healthcare um, and make sure that you know, apps websites um, that people are consuming in healthcare are held to higher standards of, of accessibility and informed choice to protect privacy. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, this research was partly funded by the EU, uh, as you can see on the slide. Um, there are some references. If anyone is interested, you can take a look at some of the, the background uh, reading in more detail. And yeah, if this raises any questions for you, any thoughts, feelings, inspirations, uh, please do get in touch. Again, my email address is there on the slide and I'd love to talk about this with you further. Thanks very much.